uh, artist, international artist that will run a Shalom studio at AVU in Prague with uh, Aneta Monakisha. She is with us and uh, I will shortly introduce her. She asked me to be really brave and uh, not to characterize her too much because, <laughs> because she will speak herself uh, about her work and not only about her work, but also about uh, her plan for uh, the class that she will teach here. Uh, unfortunately, she will start uh, in a distant manner. It will be a virtual class on the beginning. We hope that during the semester, we can welcome students also physically. Here at Chalon, you see the space. It's quite beautiful and uh, rather empty now. And uh, uh, let, me, let me introduce uh, Aneta. She was born in 1975 uh, in Romania, in Transylvania. She studied uh, fine arts in the second half of 1990s at the Academy of Fine Arts in Bratislava in Slovakia. Since 2000, when she finished the school, she started collaboration about uh, uh, with Lucia Tkačeva and uh, they uh, created, uh, let's say, a kind of a working couple. She also worked individually as well as in a couple with uh, Lucia Tkačeva. She lives uh, in between Prague, Bratislava and Transylvania. And uh, I would uh, shortly mentioned that uh, she's a multimedia artist uh, with an interest of uh, power relations and uh, her work uh, uses various medias uh, like performance, she works with objects, she works with video, with installations, so uh, this uh, just literally describes this, this multimedia. Uh, she has been together with Lucia and uh, herself alone, uh, holding a lot of uh, solo exhibitions all around the world. I'm mentioning only very few of them. Uh, and I will mention them together with uh, group exhibitions. Uh, for example, uh, she exhibited in uh, 2000, uh, and a nine uh, in Berlin, then an exhibition at Christine Kenny Gallery in Vienna 2011, uh, Waterside Contemporary uh, in London 2013. She also exhibited at 54th Venice Biennale in 2011. She participated in group exhibitions in National Museum of Contemporary Art in Bucharest, at the Tense Manifesta in St. Petersburg, in Kunstraum Kreuzberg Betanien, Berlin, Context Art Miami, which is an art fair, Transit Romania, Bucharest, Culture, Culture Center, Strombeck, Grimbergen, Whitechapel Gallery, London, and the third Moscow International Biennial for Young Art. Then she exhibited uh, in Museum of Art in Luch, at Thyssen Bornemisa Art Contemporary in Vienna, Mumok in Vienna, and many other places. So this was uh, a very short quote of a uh, few exhibitions. And uh, I would like to uh, kindly ask Aneta Munakisha to take the word. She's around the corner, actually. Ah. Hi. <laughs> the connection works. Hi. So. Uh, hello, everybody. And first of all, Thank you, Viet, uh, for the introduction and uh, both uh, Viet and Tomas for the invitation to be part of this educational project. Um, it's a great pleasure. Um, so just to um, uh, start with this um, digital and immaterial format we find ourselves in right now, I, I um, I found it um, a bit funny that I will focus my presentation on the topic of materiality. And that will also be the semester program here at the Academy of Fine Arts uh, this, sem this, uh, this semester. So let's see how it will work with this uh, uh, virtual platforms. Um, I hope to give you an intro into my works related to the subject. And uh, 
also an idea of, uh, of a few different approaches to materiality, so, um, which I hope to test here with the students uh, soon. I chose the subject because we experience today more than ever and with an unprecedented intensity how this virtual, the digital world uh, dominates our re realities. So this, all these physical material demarcation lines um, have lost uh, their, their substance. I'm here alone with Beat and Tomas in this beautiful building and I don't even know how many people I'm speaking to right now and or how many of you are really listening. So, and in addition to this lost physicality, even the linearity of time is, is disrupted. Some I see a recording of this tomorrow or next week or repeatedly or next century or I don't know. But what we know is that uh, making art and mediating it, teaching and learning, participating and exchanging, transmogrified into virtual or at most into hybrid experiences. We have a tendency to expand onto digital platforms and to create additional content to whatever we do. Now we strive more than ever for an immaterial presence since this is seen as the only safe way to interact. So materiality seems to be in the grip of the digital, in the grip of immateriality. So why in this ambience and mood and also in these conditions, it's uh, important to focus on what's material. Why and how matter matters. Why should we continue to make material things and material artworks? Well, the short answer is that um, we are real bodies entangled with other real bodies in the world as one real body. And matter matters because it speaks to us and it informs us about who we are. All of us are made of the same stuff like um, other bodies, animate or inanimate, all vibrating together to the same rhythms and of the same um, element. So in other words, thinking matter compels us to reflect on the world with this changing conditions of being mineral, vegetal, animal, human, and this in this world in which all beings um, and things and forces are involved with the same ecological and geological and also political uh, plight. Materiality is a process of flow and connections and reality. Uh, the digital, on the other hand, is by it's very nature uh, representational system based on simulations on what is real and material. So to take off with some quick examples on the topic of materiality versus representation and also the disembodiment and um, our alienation um, from material, I chose to start with a project um, I did in collaboration with Lucia Tkacheva, my long-term collaborator. I will share the screen uh, with you now. I hope you see it. Um, do you see my screen? Just, yeah. I hope, you, I ha I hope it works. Um, yes, it works. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. So um, this, um, um, as you, my knowest also as, as Vit has um, um, mentioned in the introduction, we did many projects together over the past 20 years with Lucia. And um, I'm gonna start with what is rather more, more projects, not just one project, or so one project expanding into more variants revolving about, around the concept of um, trans materiality, which is this um, emerging materiality in the hybrid zone of material and digital experimentation. Um, so this is a series of photographs of broken smartphone screens. And uh, we collected quite a big amount of discarded unfunctional screens from repair shops across Berlin. Um, all these um, phones were discarded after being um, destroyed by accidents and falls and clashes with other objects. And 
After getting hold of them, we try to bring them back to life uh, by reconnecting them to electricity. And uh, some of them started to awaken and we got um, these images that you can see now on the screen. Uh, after experiments with uh, hardware hacking and reverse engineering, we managed to resuscitate a pretty big amount of uh, these screens, which reincarnated in front of our eyes into this new phantasmal imagery. And they started to release an unimaginable potential of, of um, visual energy, uh, beautiful uh, visual coincidences. And as we all know and feel, uh, we spend a vast majority of our time staring at screens, touching them, interacting with them. Uh, we gaze daily into, into, into our phones and they are our windows into the world, actually. Uh, although screens are capable of displaying anything, they are indifferent to the patterns they carry, usually. So when we see an image on a screen, we just see it through the screen. We just uh, see the mediated image. We don't, we never look at the screen itself. A screen somehow always recedes in favor of the image it hosts, no matter how distant the content always dominates over the screen's material presence. And uh, uh, they become self-effacing, almost inv invisible. So this transmaterial nature uh, of the screens um, actually marks their fundamental duality that the screens are everywhere, in every pocket, in, in, every, in our hands all the time. Uh, they're always material, yet they often disappear as if they were immaterial. Um, so with this project, we wanted to seize this um, evanescent materiality of display, uh, this place and how, um, and somehow to reactivate their presence in the world. Um, so this abstract glowing and shimmering images became worlds in themselves when we looked at them. It was, uh, all of a sudden it was not uh, the mediated uh, image. It, uh, it's, it's, it's not windows to somewhere else. It's um, the virtuality of materiality became, becoming material. So becoming the, the materiality of uh, virtuality. And while we were looking uh, to those um, flashing screen, we felt a bit like ogres um, staring into these abstract compositions of um, these LCD particles and looking for resemblances, for familiarities, for omens for science. Uh, well, we all have this tendency to perceive abstractions and random formations as uh, something familiar and often um, meaningful. Uh, this experience is called uh, pareidolia. It's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that uh, actually we all have this partial hallucinations, interpreting vague stimuli as something known, such as seeing animals in the clouds or seeing a rab the rabbit on the moon or the Rorschach um, in blood tests are based on the same experience. So, um, and this pareidolia is also, also uh, often the base um, of many methods of divinations, like the fortune telling method that interprets patterns in tea leaves or coffee grounds or, uh, the divination that uses uh, molten metal um, um, or um, dropped in, into water. So what we propose here is that a screen um, and any broken screen actually can become a tool for divination which can provide uh, novel insights into the world through this um, intuitive interpretations that we, um, uh, that we tend to have. So the screens um, can become in some sense, uh, something like prophetic objects, something like we, we, we use this word screenomancy because all this um, um, divination methods, the fortune telling tell methods are um, just named like Asiamansi, Molibamansi, etc. So this is a, another uh, fortune telling uh, possible possibility um, actually. Um, I have a, video which I'm gonna play, but just a, uh, probably, a, um, I'm gonna turn the sound and I'm gonna just play a, a little. I'm to myself. And maybe I'm gonna just leave it. 
I'm not interested in being a version of something else. Well, this is a video that actually shows you an unaltered digital, uh, unaltered uh, image footage of this um, uh, screens um, flickering. And um, there's no animation. It's just the edited raw recording or this of this uh, device is generating this uh, uh, widely grown images. And um, the only edit sound is the uh, editing is the sound. Uh, the voice of the pixel that came alive, free from content, control, and representation, and uh, which is driven by the forces which uh, no longer operate with codes and commands. So, pixel is somehow speaking about this freedom um, that it has from this um, human control. Freedom to feel free and to make mistakes. I give myself the freedom to be less than perfect. I vacate my state in favor of data-free self, randomness, and anti-representation. I found freedom in the age of confusion. The chains that bound me fell away. I chose the path of abstraction. I am liberated of intention, uncerebral, unburdened, no strings attached. want to decorate. Beauty must conquer the lust for order. Order is ugliness. Anarchy is beauty and beauty is anarchy. I live within my means. I keep my liquidity and remain nimble-minded. Okay, um, I think um, um, I will just um, add to it that um, any meaning that we would assign to these images, what uh, that I was talking about, this tendency of ours, uh, would come solely from this human mind, but this that's why it kind of can become a prophetic hallucination of uh, this time of singularity, which acts on us through this um, um, charisma, to this aesthetic, to this in, in, ineffable um, uh, charismatic beauty. Um, the next uh, um, part of this project is um, an immersive installation. Uh, which we did with enlarged images of the broken screens printed on glass. Actually, uh, they were looking very much like real screens. There's a, a luminous sheet attached in the back on the glass uh, plate. So, um, and also the glass is uh, a reflexive glass. So they, they really um, um, look exactly like um, the screens uh, of our phones. And uh, this, environment simulates um, mm, an Alice in Wonderland situation for the visitor, which is somehow descaled while this phone screens become almost like doors or windows. So um, the visitor is all of a sudden small. And uh, um, I would say that the installation also alluded to this other um, uh, Lewis Carroll's um, Alice novel, The World to the Looking Glass, since all the screens around us are these immersive looking glasses, which um, become doorways into this infinity or of um, virtual realities or other realities. Or, uh, so entering this uh, installation made the viewer feel like she's entering um, into something else, into a different world. 
and the visitor could see the reflections uh, uh, on, in the big um, screens while at the same time they could attempt to read these abstract messages around them. Also, they could see the, the world upside down, another somehow allusion to this uh, fantastic um, world or this in inverse logic of um, uh, Lewis Carroll's um, novels. Um, the prophecy of things extended. This is another immersive space um, in which we took an image uh, of uh, one of the broken screens and um, made an extended um, um, space actually um, with it um, in which the visitor could actually enter. So the gallery, this was done in Bucharest in Sandwich Gallery and the whole gallery was completely transformed into this fabric tunnel with that was a real material, palpable and um, tactile uh, simulation of this unreal reality of this uh, abstraction. So um, this reality also looked like something rather virtual. Um, so it was again this um, the working with this um, on this verge of uh, materiality and virtuality and virtuality and materiality. Um, Another translation of the broken screen images was uh, into this tapestries, this hand woven textile pieces. Um, how do the displays and the digital connect to weaving? Well, weaving has been a binary art from its very, very beginning. Uh, it applies operations of patterns, um, that are binary, that are mathematical for millennia. Uh, so making, when, when making a tapestry, when making a weave, one has to operate with zeros and ones. So woven textiles uh, were created by using this mathematical process. And um, um, actually the weaving technique itself was the precursor of computer sciences, the weaving loom, looms, especially the Jacquard loom, inspired the first general purpose computer, a mechanical computer at the time in the 19th century. And uh, um, Ada Lovelace even compared uh, this analytical engine, as they called it back then, to a Jacquard loom. So the first computer was actually a, a, um, a weaving um, machine. Another project that also deals with this uh, material transposition and translation, this time from one material to another, is this um, uh, world, work entitled Clash. And uh, this takes the form of an installation that looks like one of those piles of um, cobblestones, paving stones, usually found on construction sites and streets. and um, and stones have been used as weapons and tools since prehistoric times, but we also connect them very much to, um, uh, to these um, um, weapons of the week, to these handy projectiles used by street protesters. Um, and also, they were also used to, to build defense like barricades and fortifications. So they very much um, are connected to this um, um, uh, weapons to this uh, violent clashes, maybe, let's say. And uh, the stone's potential role as this improvised weapon is transformed here by the use of material they are made of, because um, although they're looking very realistic, um, they were manufactured in coast called casting porcelain, and you see now here on this picture that um, they are very fragile and thin. Uh, they're hand painted, painted with acrylic paint and uh, in order to produce a very veristic appearance of, of a real stone. But in, in reality, they're, they're very light and very thin, something like eggshells and hollow inside. So this, these are handmade rather artifacts or I don't know, stones, uh, which become precious and vulnerable objects and, and are, are more uncanny or prop-like. So visitors in the gallery are allowed to touch them. So um, these objects are open to closer examination, to a tactile, tactile to a palpable second look. Um, 
And so everybody can get to know uh, their texture, their weight, their, their nature much better. And of course, there's uh, this uh, tactile scrut scrutiny gives a, a sense of um, materiality and empathy because many people don't expect they, the, the, the way they grab the stone is they have a very, uh, like they expect something else. And so there's this moment of surprise and sometimes even this uh, uh, destroying the stone because it's really crumbles in their hands if they, they, the, their grip is too strong, prepared for, for gripping or for lifting a stone. So um, that's um, uh, this material uh, translation is here to, to uh, make sense of a different materiality. Uh, the next project is um, a material translation of a book or an idea into, um, into, into a, something material. Um, the book is uh, this book, the, the Island by Aldous Huxley. It's the last book written by Huxley after this dystopian, his famous dystopian novel, The Brave New World. He decided he wanted to also write a new, something uh, about utopia. And um, he describes a paradisial um, island uh, whose uh, inhabitants live in a utopian society. This society is class-free, religion-free, spiritually evolved. Um, all these people living on this island are enlightened human beings. Um, and in order to remind the, the people uh, living there to live in the here and now, in the present moment, Huxley uses, employs this um, a kind of word therapy transmitted by birds called Mina birds. And these birds fly around screeching and um, calling all the time, here and now attention, here and now, as some sort of reminders to, to bring one's attention to the present moment. So, and thus to, to be able to get over whatever is hindering um, happiness. So <clears throat> it's a sort of mindfulness device. And the installation, um, entitled Attention Here and Now, Voice Here and Now, was framed as a um, black, in, black and white environment animated by a pair of um, colorful parrots. And uh, these parrots were trained for months to, to be able to speak, to vocalize the words here, now, and attention. And uh, they could speak anytime. Uh, uncontrollably, like we couldn't control them, but um, this is, uh, they sometimes greeted the visitors with um, uh, attention. Um, so these were some sort of uh, whimsical devices bringing attention to the here and now. So in this um, uh, space we created, uh, we wanted to recreate this feeling of the ideal island through a visual structure, an environment that uh, was supposed to materialize space and time simultaneously. So, um, and we wanted to achieve an illusionistic rendering of the time-space continuum represented by a warping pattern erupting in this uh, sculptural three-dimensionality. Um, the living birds were a further indicated, indicator of something uh, that is integral to, to this present moment, this idea that uh, the present constantly shifts or changes. Uh, the dynamic aspect of time was, was um, enhanced by, by this uh, um, vertiginous time-space curvature we, we, which we borrowed from this um, scientific um, um, physical representations, uh, 3D representation of time-space. And uh, all this, this grid and all these uh, elements in the, in the space also um, um, the wire structure served as a temporal hab habitat for the birds, like a cage for the here and now. So they were part of, of all this. Uh, another project that uh, deals in a different way now with materiality and uh, representation or virtuality is um, things in our hands. 
uh, in which we melted uh, around 60 kilograms of euro coins in order to make a series of sculptures from, from the metal money, from the coins. And uh, the euro coins are made of steel. So steel melts at 1,500 degrees or 1,700 degrees Celsius. Um, and the red golden part of the coin is actually copper and the copper melts at just 1000 degrees. So by the time the steel is molten, by the time it's, uh, it's hot and liquid, the copper burned completely. So it's, it's totally evaporated. Um, I almost melted my camera when I was taking these pictures. So it's really, really very hot. And um, what we got from these forms are copies of our hand imprints. Matter held in and shaped by hand. The shapes are somewhat resembling prehistoric hand axes, these old instruments from the ages when money was not an issue yet. So uh, they make um, reference to the first tools human produced. Uh, we aimed to transform the money in use, the, the money we have, material money, into something useful, into something that would serve as a survival means, um, something that would be precious for their functional and uh, maybe artistic value. Uh, but most importantly, we wanted to liberate money from uh, its form of social control. So the sculptures can be seen as fossils of the past and at the same time, fossils for the future, a state of before and after of money. So on one hand, these, these are some details of the um, individual object. Uh, these objects are rooted in prehistory, let's say on one hand, in time before there was no money, before money was invented. But on the other hand, they are forecasting the um, after apocalyptic future, the time after money when money will become valueless, I will only, will, will only count uh, and be used as um, pure matter, something useful. Um, and there are a few things that are intriguing about the materiality of money. Uh, money serves as a direct and physical carrier for value, but um, actually the value is fictional. Um, uh, the material of both coins and banknotes does not correspond to the value they represent um, mm -hmm. material. So it's a symbolical contractual value and an agreement we all have, um, a religion we all believe in. So, um, and then there's this bizarre hierarchy of materials. The metal is subjugated to paper. Coins have usually lower value than banknotes in general. So. Uh, but the, in reality, metal is more expensive um, um, than paper. So um, there's many ab absurdities in money and uh, in, in addition to this um, fictional um, aspect, they... Um... Another thing is uh, that money becomes more, more virtual. The physical currency today um, accounts for less than 10% of all money there is in the world. So, and with this increasing uh, virtualization of all transactions, financial transactions, and uh, also with the rise of uh, cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, uh, the physical money will probably become obsolete and extinct in the future. So, um, over the past few years, I also started a different artistic collaboration. This is uh, this, this time it's a, a collaboration directly with materials, uh, getting um, into material intimacies more, uh, maybe let's say. And this project was a roughly sketched uh, biography of calcium, proposing a fusion of what we divide as natural and artificial, as uh, um, as um, uh, creation and growth, um, living or not living, and so on. So this project was telling a little story about uh, the invisible bonds of matter and materials. Uh, it was the bonds of the walls, the floor, the gallery building, the soil, 
sell the material used in the gallery, the, in the installation, uh, the visitor herself, uh, everything. So all these things contain calcium. Um, calcium, this is what you see now on the slide, is um, one of the most abundant compound on the earth crust. And it's a metal. Uh, impossible to find isolated in a natural form. So it's, it's a highly promiscuous substance and, it's, and due to its reactiveness and uh, high solubility, it was easily um, metabolized by the first forms of living organisms and it became um, uh, indispensable for life itself. And uh, most uh, living entities are dependent on, on calcium now and uh, the calcium is permanently metamorphized or metamorphizes from rocks to, to soil, to water, to algae, to, to plants, to um, uh, bacteria, to um, fish or mollusks, to, 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 to animal or humans and, and so on. And then it goes back um, into this circuit it, it's 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 a permanent cycle it's so and when we picture this cycle we um maybe can realize uh, easier that this uh, that we actually are the future of all minerals the limes the sedimentary rocks uh, and the way the limestones are, are our geological past now because they all form from ancient living vertebrates and shells. So this is what, what it is. It's just uh, um, um, skeletons and shells compressed by time. And um, uh, we are the proteins that plants converted from the calcium containing soil and will become soon the nutrients feeding other calcium loving organisms and us. So we feed on it. And um, uh, in the sense, my approach to materials I'm uh, is uh, um, is uh, coming from looking at matter as one flow or movement or, or something that is unstable and uncontainable, uh, unhierarchical, and and even I like to call it four-dimensional matter. So it's it's um, it's more than three dimension. Here in this uh, um, object, uh, plants germinate from uh, from plaster sculptures. And uh, uh, plaster or gypsum, as uh, we might also know uh, it, is uh, actually calcium sulfate. So um, it's composed of uh, calcium and sulfur and it's widely used in agriculture as a fertilizer and a soil amendment, especially for acidic soil. And besides, balancing the pH of the soil, it also provides plants with two vital nutrients, the this, this sulfur and the calcium. And some plants have evolved uh, an ability to not only tolerate gypsum, but um, also to require it to be dependent on, on, uh, on highly alkaline and um, um, soil containing lots of calcium, lots of lime. Uh, so after casting all kinds of seed of these plants, like uh, the, 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 the gypsophiles, the, the, the loving, uh, the plants that love um, calcium are called um, gypsophiles. And uh, I chose some gypsophiles that um, um, I found like beans and mustard and lettuce and lupin and um, lots of um, um, plants that uh, qualified for this kind of um, habitat. And I casted them into this uh, zygotic plaster shapes and uh, they started to germinate and cracking the plaster and transforming this uh, smooth shapes of the cast into something totally different. So it's, uh, they become um, other objects actually. The, it's, um, uh, they were growing slowly and uh, turning green, some ended up flowering uh, and I even managed to get a couple of pods. But what I, um, um, uh, I really enjoyed doing is this collaboration with matter is uh, um, kind of um, uh, changing this um, or shifting from this um, Mm. 
helomorphic model and doing something that um, testing something of if, if it's possible and how it's possible to include matter itself in creative processes instead of making and producing things according to the to this old helomorphic model which means imposition of uh, form onto materials i facilitate this uh, different things like growing or migration of uh, some materials of or substances onto other materials and onto other objects. So uh, this is uh, again plaster cast, which um, I um, um, soaked in uh, um, vinegar together with um, other calcium containing, containing materials or, or um, things like bones or conches or snail shells or eggshells, like all these things are calcium carbonate, which is the same um, um, chemical composition like marble or limestone. And uh, the vinegar dissolves the calcium, especially in this um, uh, so soft eggshells or shells. It dissolves uh, sometimes, breaking breaks them down completely. Um, and it's, it's a process similar to this um, acid rain or acid, acidic oceans, uh, which are bleaching corals or weathering natural rocks or dissolving and killing um, all, all kinds of self, shellfish. So um, this, um, after vine vinegar evaporates, all these melted shells and conches deposit on other pieces of rocks and on the petri dishes trays, uh, drawing novel structures and changing the shape and the character of rocks or um, 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 plaster casts and creating new textures. And, um, and thus different materials and objects transfer from one to another. Uh, the animal world shifts to the mineral world uh, while the mineral uh, is actually a sedimented animal and vegetal and all those, um, yeah, all those stones are actually just dead organisms compressed by time, as I mentioned. So, um, so it's just this, um, this invisible movement, this molecular interaction or molecular um, sculpting through this uh, molecular um, um, entanglement of different materials. Um, yeah, that's a uh, piece of marble with eggshells, I guess. Yes, and this is speaking of invisibility, invisible movements and molecular um, actions, activities. Uh, this is another um, um, series of sculptures that um, host uh, transformative processes of um, fermentation. And this is sculptures for making pickled vegetables. And uh, the head is um, considered to be the, the place, the locus of our uh, feeling of autonomy, independence, um, sovereignty, um, control. And here it's, uh, it's used as, as a space for uh, fermenting cultures, so um, different kind of culture. And uh, these uh, sculptures actually allude to the fact that the, these microbial um, colonies and um, are really, um, and life, life forms are really indispensable for for the life processes and uh, all of us, everybody is colonized with this uh, invisible allies, uh, which are actually helping us to survive, are keeping us alive, are helping us digest food and um, um, bend our elbows and everything. So we are actually helped by other microorganisms to exist and to feel good. And, um, um, this is the last work that somehow um, I will show that somehow connects to the, the, what I um, talked previously. And it's, it's called the gut. And uh, this dealt with monuments and uh, with the cult of the head as representation of ideas and ideologies. And it's, um, it's a sculpture that is now exhibited in Germany in Chemnitz, in, uh, in Schiller Park, in a park, um, in public space. <clears throat> and it was interesting for us how all this uh, 
thinkers, heroes, big historical figures, and um, everyone important are always depicted as portraits or busts or head-centered monuments. And um, uh, that seems to be a reminiscence of this um, rationalistic thinking of this Cartesian decapitation and this dualistic mutilation of the human organism, uh, illustrating the separation from the body uh, of the body from the from the mind from the head, and this is uh, uh, the Karl Marx monument that is in Chemnitz, and um, it's actually Marx's largest head sculpture in the world. There is one more um, head which is bigger, which is Lenin somewhere I think in China, uh, but it's. The actual head is actually over seven meters tall, and in total, the bust uh, weighs 40 tons, and uh, it stands over 13 meters high. So it's really a huge sculpture that is um, a, a public monument that um, somehow uh, defines and um, um, marks um, visibly the landscape of the city of Chemnitz. And the sculpture was done in, um, uh, was commissioned by the East German government, hired by, uh, uh, they hired the Soviet sculptor uh, Lev Kerbel to design this monument to celebrate the city's then namesake, Karl Marx Stadt. So Chemnitz was named Karl Marx Stadt before, and they commissioned this big uh, monument. Um, and um, it's a beautiful monument, actually, which very much dominates the, the, the city. but. Um, we found it bizarre when we first uh, started to think about the public sculpture in Chemnitz. We uh, found the, the, the monument beautiful, but uh, it kind of followed this habitual patriarchal, patriarchal canon of representation, which cuts the head and uh, just you know places it on a, on a pedestal and uh, downplays the body and omits uh, the topological complexity of consciousness and obscures other, uh, not only other parts, body parts, but uh, other entities and that uh, that live not only in us, in our guts or on our skin, but also around us. So we felt like it's time to, uh, to see and to look at this uh, Karl Marx monument differently. And we uh, made um, 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 a model of the, his large intestine, the gut, um, in proportion to the head. So it's a very large sculpture that uh, somehow um, fits to this head. So if um, uh, Chemnitz is the city with the head, so now the, the city has also a gut. So that's that's something that we wanted also to play with. So it doesn't only has to be uh, the head that. Um, defines a city, but uh, it can also have guts. And also it's uh, somehow, um, it's this metaphor of digestion, the, this undigested part was uh, somehow um, offering itself to, to scrutiny. So um, ontologically, the head is quite small in comparison to the guts because the, the gut is the last part of the, a gastrointestinal tract and it's home to the biggest number of uh, living entities in our body. It's, um, it's, it's a colony of uh, billions of uh, little organisms and this makes it the most prominent ecological symbiosis of uh, human and non-human parts actually. Uh, so it's the place of an intrinsic solidarity, which makes somehow um, this gut um, a monument to the microbiome rather than to Marx. And Marx's microbiomes have surely had a great impact on his ideas and uh, by extension on how our world is today and how, how everything is, um, uh, yeah, on how our politics is today. Um, and it certainly, deserves a monument just as much as his head does. So this is an attempt to remind ourselves that we should uh, pay more attention to the body, not only this um, anthropocentric body, but to bodies as environments 
hosting ecosystems, hosting other environments and ecosystems in miniature. And also instead of tearing down monuments, maybe we should uh, create um, a new mythology around the monuments and also we should maybe just surround existing statues with and monuments uh, with, with, with monuments to other bodies, to, to, to non-human bodies, to uh, non-terrestrial bodies, or to, to dead bodies, or uh, any kind of bodies. So, um, yeah, I could talk more about this, but I guess this, the time is up now, so I think this is, this is it. I, I thank you very much for your attention, and if there are questions, maybe, yeah, so we open up for questions now. This is... Uh, the children loved the sculpture, I, I must say, and it became actually a furniture for, for public space. And uh, this is how it was meant to be actually a horizontal, uh, non-hierarchical uh, sculpture that can be colonized by people and used by them. And the children got the idea right away. And this is an aerial view of the, of the gut. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Aneta, for your colorful and uh, engaging talk about material processes and uh, virtuality and uh, ideas. Uh, I would have two questions uh, before we open uh, before we open the floor. And the first question actually would uh, come from the video that you showed. And uh, in the video, I just heard one one sentence, something like. Uh, that uh, there is a search for a beauty or uh, beauty must conquer the order, something like that. And my question would be actually, uh, when I also look at your earlier works and at your, at your latest work, is the idea of beauty or is beauty itself something that that is interesting to you? Is it of your interest, the old, uh, question or uh, uh, phenomena of beauty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the second question maybe would be, when, then I wrap it, the second question would be, what, what would you do in Shalom actually? Because we are here in, in the context of uh, art pedagogy, art teaching. So how do you imagine that, that uh, a virtual distance learning could uh, go on during this semester? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yeah, so for the first question, um, of course, beauty, well, beauty has uh, various definitions, but I found uh, this aesthetic dimension very important for, um, for visual arts, because I think this is, um, this is the language that we speak through. It's a second language. So in order to, and I often combine also words, and um, I, I work with language a lot, but uh, when I work with materials or in, you know, real forms, I think this, um, they should somehow um, come with, their with the language on their own. And um, um, the language has to be somehow appealing to the viewer, to the spectator, and it has to communicate something. It has to entrap at, at least somebody or, or uh, magnetize you so that you 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 come you can come closer. So I, I would say, I would say this is uh, um, it's it's a language, and I, I found this this is the the dialect that I chose, and um, um, and the second question is. Um, yeah, what will we do in Shalom? Uh, I realize, and I, I've been thinking how to um, organize and um, structure the whole thing. And, and indeed, it's kind of paradoxical working with material uh, while staying virtual. But I think there's many ways how to look uh, uh, at material and uh, materials, and I want to to start to uh, really look attentively and deep to to everything that is material. I um, I think that a sort of biographical or anthropological approach to materials would be um, um, a good start because um, maybe the way I 
uh, alluded to this uh, to this problem was through this um, uh, the biography of calcium that I showed you, and it, it was it was a research based um, uh, project that um, um, actually expanded into uh, a, a better understanding of uh, um, everything around. Uh, us because uh, whenever you take a material, whatever it is, whether it's it's uh, it's wood or plastic or a substance or soil, it's just um, it's connected to everything else there is. So I just like this. Um, mm, I find it fascinating, and I hope the students will find it fascinating as well. This um, um, uh, monumentality of each. A banal material that that you can think of. So I would say that we will uh, we will start to to look into these materials more closely. Whatever materials they they want to choose, I will um, um, ask them to come up with with anything they're interested in. It can be a material that they worked with previously before they are. Um, attracted to they used in their works and by starting to going deeper into that I think they would start to discover much more interesting contexts and information about that and of course I expect uh, and I hope to test some processes and in in the course of the of the semester also here uh, with Tomas let's see how it will it will work maybe we will manage to really materialize some of the uh, things at the end. Yes, <laughs> Tomas. Yeah. Okay, good. So I, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to a lot of processual works and also lots of discussions about uh, materials and uh, um, stories like all, all, every material has has its own story, has life story. So we can uh, just look where, where it came from, how it, uh, wh where it was born uh, and what, what it did through, through its uh, life through its existence uh, on this planet and and what how do we imagine the future of this material even and so there's lots of imagination fantasy involved in in it too um, besides um, researching the past of them yeah do you have any other questions to Aneta some of the visitors No questions? Okay, so I think the, what Aneta said at the latest was a great invitation for everybody to join our semester in Shalom. Uh, so please, all the students who are watching us, uh, you can join us uh, in Shalom. And the first meeting will take part on Monday at 10 o'clock and follow the information on, on Facebook, uh, the studio of the visiting artist, or via email. So you have to contact me uh, through the email you can find on the Abu webpage. And Aneta, thank you again. Um, maybe lecture. if I can oh, uh, Nicola, ask yeah. one, one thing. Yes, please. <laughs> um, I asked myself, what is uh, your, where, where would you differ between um, material and medium, for example, and what would you count as material? Where does that end? Um, well, any... They can even overlap, I would say. A material can be a medium. Um, so um, any material mediates something. But um, I, I don't know if this answers your question. What, what do you want to know? I, I think specifically. So it's. Uh, this, uh, no, it's maybe that, that is just the hunter. Uh, um, I was just asking myself if you differ between these two um, words, is, or is, is there is like a, like a cutting point, or uh, where it uh, goes from the one side to the other, and then uh, maybe the other one was was a different question, um, like is there something? Uh, is it just uh, like meant material in arts, so it can be like. I mean, in, in arts, anything can be can be the material of my work, or can uh, or is there like like a definite ending for for you where it is not material anymore because maybe like it's not materialistic or something like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, no. Um, well, what I think that is um, um, maybe more um, important today, or what I find uh, interesting today is that um, also in art we can look or we should maybe look um, at materials and uh, not not just take them for granted, but um, um, really let them speak and listen to the stories they have to say. So in this sense, they, yes, they do become um, mediums because they do have something to say. They do have a say in the whole story of like, so whenever we're using, it's not the same thing if you're doing a portrait ahead from, um, from, from clay or from bread or from uh, um, ice, it's, it tells a different story. So the material is very important. And um, so in this respect, this um, uh, we can just um, think this material. We, we can think with materials, not only about them, but with them. So it's a sort of like, you know, um, mm, getting closer and as I mentioned before I like the word collaborating with those materials not just taking them as, as some materials that have to obey our ideas or our the image that we have in, in, in our uh, head in our minds and then we just impose them on, on anything so it's more than that it's more it's, it's a kind of like it supplies an understanding of this vortex of life and all the cycles and and uh, all this precarious proximities of, uh, that we have with all, all kinds of materials and um, mm, yeah so and also the 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 virtual thing like you know this, this is uh, you know all the digital um the digital world and the digital realm it, uh, actually also has is also interesting to question or to look into or to think of like nothing is really non-existent and we're so dependent on so many things just in order to 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 have um, um, so many material things in order to have something virtual or digital so uh, maybe just understanding this the importance of this um, uh, the essence of this uh, um, material sens sensibility, let's say. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think uh, in, in great parts. Uh, maybe um, to get a bit more specific, if there's still time, um, in your works with the, uh, with the uh, screens of the smartphones, uh, where these the screens the material you are working with or is there something greater like is there is the idea kind of the material or like is electricity the material you're working with or yeah, it's it's everything it's it's this exactly it's this codependence of uh, forces and things and and then um images because you know that's it's uh, they all have to be there in order for for this to exist so this is not a singular presence that it's um, um, uh, self-contained it all, always just exists in collaboration in permanent collaboration it's it dependent on this um yeah uh, electricity and the screens that was this um as i said um i don't want to repeat many things but it's just um it's just rendering present something that we we usually don't see so something that is um uh, invisible to us uh it's just like uh, waking up from this uh mediated uh, reality because we just look through and we don't see the screen itself like you know we we uh, like seldomly just look and we realize it's a glass and what kind of material is made of it. We usually, we stare at it daily or like hourly and we just see the, the what's behind it. So it was just kind of bringing back like, uh, because those, those screens were just the discarded screens, nothing. So they started to work with what was, what, what, what was left materially, what was, um, uh, and uh, was able to to be revived or reactivated by this electricity. So, yeah. Um, and maybe maybe you know the the series uh, Black Mirror. 
Yeah. 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 I think uh, I heard uh, like the the makers of that told in uh, an interview or something that the inspiration for the name came um, from this moment when when there's a loading screen or nothing happening on the screen and it's, it's black, like when you turn your device off or something like, like that, and you have just the uh, the reflection of yourself on the on yeah. the screen. Yeah, but even then, but that's the thing that even when the, the, the screen is off, we still don't see the screen. We see the reflection of ourselves in the screen. That's right. So that's yeah. So so it's it's so tricky that it absolutely disappears. It has this tendency to be um, invisible, to be self, to, to be evanescent, to be uh, yeah, self-effacing. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Uh, and I'm looking very forward to this. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. OK, dear colleagues and visitors, uh, if there are no more questions, are there some questions? Ah, we have a late incomer really coming from for the last minute. so. Uh, Aneta is leaving uh, her room. If there, if there are no questions, we say hello from Shalom Studio and looking forward to see you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>